goes like... Yeah. This. This. Okay. Like this. I'll put this in my pocket, yeah. No writing. Okay, yeah. Um, so, um, the, um, the navigator, the University of Florida um, autonomous vehicle, um, has the ability to operate uh, using LiDAR and, and several other sensors, and I'll talk about how um, autonomy works. So, autonomous vehicles are supposed to use sensors that are on the vehicle to detect what's happening around their environment. They are also based on, um, on maps of the, of the terrain. And so they can be programmed to um, go from an origin to a destination for following a particular route uh, with information about uh, the map of the and the terrain um, and also sensors, radar, LiDAR that is on the vehicle um, to detect obstacles as the vehicle goes through, um, through the route. Um, the, the one down at the uh, bottom is one of those uh, little autonomous shuttles um, which um, are used as a transit type vehicle. Usually they have six be between six and 12 um, seats. And uh, um, I'll talk some more about some of the experiments uh, that we're starting uh, in, um, in Gainesville. Um, so have you heard of connected vehicles? Okay, some of you have. Uh, so the autonomous vehicles are more self-sufficient and they have information that allows them to travel through uh, the terrain. The connected vehicles have equipment that allows them to communicate with other vehicles, uh, called V2V com communication, or to communicate with the um, infrastructure, uh, V2I type communication. Um, so the Connected vehicles don't have to be autonomous and vice versa. When both those technologies um, are in, in a vehicle, uh, those are what we call connected and autonomous. And so they have, when you have the connectivity, um, as I'm going to show you, you have a lot more information that the, the vehicle can receive, which is not immediately visible but by the sensors in an autonomous vehicle. Uh, so there are kind of two different types of technologies and there is now a lot of uh, discussion in the U.S. Um, about connected vehicles and or autonomous vehicles. The federal government started with um, connected vehicle deployment and testing and so on. The industry is moving forward with autonomous vehicles and um, the two haven't come together yet but what we're doing uh, with i street is we're trying to bring them together because we think that both of them bring um, very important uh, parts in making the advanced technologies work so uh, with um, autonomous vehicles uh, the image top right shows you uh, what the lighter um, might be able to show in terms of um, the path of the vehicle. And I'm going to show you a little bit more um, on that. Um, Velodyne is one of the companies, um, the, the best known company for producing um, LiDAR. Uh, those uh, shoot out um, uh, rays and they rotate and they identify um, obstacles. Uh, so the more rays you have, the more expensive the lighter is going to be. Um, I think uh, the prices for a lighter, the, mo the most accurate ones were like was like sixty thousand dollars, which is unrealistic to have something like that on a thirty thousand ve uh, dollar vehicle. Um, there are some cheaper ones, and if you follow a little bit the the Tesla. You're familiar with Tesla and Elon Musk. Elon Musk has said, LiDAR is useless. We're only the most um, uh, useful uh, tool is video. 
And so his vehicles don't rely on LiDAR, they rely on video and other sensors. So there's also that kind of um, um, tension between LiDAR on the one hand and video on the other. Um, video or cameras are, are, are cheaper than, than LiDAR. Uh, so this is uh, as far as autonomy. This is one of our experimental um, communication units. So we call it we call it a suitcase <laughs> because it is a suitcase. It's uh, like I said, it's it's not for um, uh, for commercial purposes. It's more for uh, for us to do our experiments, and it has a unit within the vehicle, <coughs> and then. We install, uh, you know, whenever we're doing our experiments, a unit at an intersection. Um, once we have full deployment, we will have those units um, at specific locations in, in the network. Um, so that's kind of how uh, different um, uh, types of equipment help with, uh, with vehicle uh, connectivity and autonomy. So in, in theory, what an autonomous vehicle going through the network um, should be able to see, what, we, what it needs to see, is it needs to see every object, pedestrians, other vehicles, cones, um, within its uh, range of view, so that it's, uh, it can make, uh, it can g gather this information um, and, and then it can make decisions about uh, what to do about the presence of those, um, of those objects. Um, and uh, what, however, LiDAR, uh, the way LiDAR works and what it might be able to see is because it shoots those rays and it um, identifies kind of obstacles for those rays, this is what it ends up seeing at the moment in terms of um, clouds of points. And then with, based on those clouds of points, um, researchers use machine learning to say, okay, this cloud of points here represents a pedestrian. This cloud of points represents uh, a stationary object. This cloud of points represents uh, a vehicle. And so there is uh, the sensors, um, Ideally, would you, what we would want them to say, oh, there's a pedestrian, and identify that pedestrian the way we looking at the, um, in, at the, at the video would we, or uh, when we drive, we'd be able to identify. But the reality is that um, there is some interpretation that has to happen, whether it's LiDAR or video. Video, is, it's, uh, it's also similar in terms of pattern recognition from the video so that you identify what an object is and provide that information to the vehicle's logic and then have that logic decide what to do about it. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, there was an incident in Arizona with an Uber vehicle that uh, uh, ended up killing a, uh, a bicyclist crossing the road in the dark. The vehicle, as I understand it, uh, its logic and its sensors were able to identify that there was an object. Um, but the way the engineers uh, had programmed it, um, the, the logic said, oh, this is nothing, bypass, ignore. And so there are two steps here. One is the identification of the object, and the second is what the algorithm is going to do um, in terms of taking particular uh, specific action related to that. Um, they had a, um, a safety driver, and the safety driver was just not paying attention because they had not, um, I think Uber had not uh, specifically said, you have to pay attention all the time and take action and, and look in front of you when, when you're uh, in the vehicle. And so, um, unfortunately, we have a lot uh, more work to do in terms of um, how vehicles um, are able to see the world through the sensors and how they're able to translate that information into action. Um, I'm going to show you one example where, um, you know, one particular scenario 
um, where an autonomous vehicle is approaching um, the sidewalk. And so the vehicle, or it's the sensors on the vehicle, may be able to see um, the pedestrian crossing, the crosswalk. They may be able to see the bicyclist. And then, yes, OK, they're able to see the pedestrian standing on the side of the road. But what they're not able to see or, or figure out is, what, what is this pedestrian doing? Are they re getting ready to cross? Should, we, should the vehicle decelerate? Um, or are they just standing there waiting for something? So intent, which is it's something that no matter how many sensors you have looking at the surroundings, you're not going to be able to have that intent. Um, so what is important is when we're building those types of systems to be thinking about uh, the vehicle, the driver, and the infrastructure. And you've all probably seen such a figure before, right? This is how the transportation operations um, work. We have to, any, any, any time we're evaluating uh, in, in traffic operations, um, transportation planning, whatever it is, in our, in our uh, highway system, we look at the driver, we look at the vehicle, and we uh, look at the environment. Um, in terms of um, environment, we may be looking at how many lanes, what the grades are. Um, that is, interacts with the vehicle capability. So if you have a long truck with low weight to horsepower ratio and you have a steep grade, it's going to go much slower. And so there is a relationship between the capabilities of the vehicle and the capabilities of the, of the infrastructure. Um, when you have um, conservative drivers versus aggressive drivers, they're going to um, react differently to, to the infrastructure. Uh, the capabilities of the, of the vehicle and the driver, if you have a more aggressive driver, they will likely pick a faster, more aggressive um, vehicle. So when we're evaluating um, the, um, the entire highway system, all three elements feed together for us to be able to um, determine how the system is, is going to work. If we have, a, uh, like in Florida, we have a lot of older drivers. So a lot of older drivers means you're going to have a certain type of operations, maybe lower speeds and so on. If you have, like in the University of Florida, it's a, it's a um, university town. There's a lot of younger drivers, very different um, environments. So the type of driver and uh, the expectations of, of the traveler affect the way the system um, would work. And so in terms of how we are designing our systems, even for advanced technologies, we have to, be, we have to consider also those three elements. That does not change by going from conventional vehicles to autonomous um, and connected. Let me take you for a minute back to when the, the vehicles were first uh, invented. Uh, these are some vehicles in Germany uh, on the left and then on the right. Um, vehicles, um, one of the first vehicles uh, from, from the US. And back when vehicles were being introduced, you know how people were, uh, what transportation mode they were using, right? Horses. So horses were the most prevalent. And so when, the, when these vehicles uh, started to be introduced, um, it, uh, it was very difficult to have these ve the vehicles with the horses on the same uh, road, because the horses were getting spooked by, uh, by the vehicles and uh, the noise. And so it created a lot of different issues. But uh, horses were dirty. They were being. Uh, misused actually uh, or abused uh, and so the existing uh, at the time system was problematic there were uh, accidents and so on horses uh, were not controllable but so what they were trying to do at the time is to include to incorporate those vehicles into um, the existing network with horses 
Um, but the horses didn't like it. So here's an invention they came up with. They put a horse head in front of those vehicles um, in what the idea was to um, make the horses think that this is another horse. <laughs> well, that didn't work because horses uh, uh, could smell that this is not another horse. Um, but, you know, we're kind of in a similar point right now where we have autonomous vehicles that are being introduced and we don't know how humans are going to react to this and how other drivers will react to this. So we're going through another transition, but you know, the, the basics are the same. We still have to consider the, the humans, we still have to consider the, the machines, we still have to consider the, the infrastructure. Um, so one of the, I don't know if you've seen this, but uh, this is uh, one of the, um, automobile companies um, trying to create an autonomous vehicle with eyes so that when you are a pedestrian um, and you're waiting to cross, um, you know th what the intent of the vehicle at least is. Um, and so um, we are now putting humans instead of a horse head in front of the vehicle. It's a, it's a very similar uh, uh, concept. Uh, but so the, the point is you have to have that kind of communication between the vehicle um, and, and the pedestrian. Um, and autonomy by itself is not going to, to provide that. Um, let me show you another example. Uh, this is um, uh, traffic getting into um, New York, I believe, and this is an area where um, you have to pick a lane depending on your, on your destination. Um, so imagine that you have an autonomous vehicle there, and the autonomous vehicle knows where it wants to go, uh, but it, is, it has many other conventional vehicles around them, um, and the autonomous vehicle has its sensors and so on, and it tries to avoid um, uh, crashing into other vehicles, and it has to pick a lane. What will the rest of the conventional vehicles do? Are they going to let them go through? Like, uh, uh, you know, oh, yeah, please, go ahead. Uh, that, that really doesn't happen. I mean, it doesn't happen in big cities. It, maybe it happens in, in smaller cities, but so how should the autonomous vehicle function in this case to be able to, uh, to operate within, within this environment and interact with other drivers in a way where it's not too timid, it's not too aggressive. Um, and for um, autonomous vehicle uh, manufacturers, you know, from their perspective, they want to keep long distances, they want to avoid crashes, they want to sell those vehicles, and the only, to, from their perspective, they want to avoid crashes. Um, but if you're trying to navigate this, how are you going to do it? So autonomy and sensors and so on um, are not going to be enough. Um, perhaps connected uh, vehicle technologies are, provides uh, a better way to do this through connectivity between vehicles so that you're able to have um, communication and some kind of a priority within this network where you're able to, uh, to, um, uh, to travel through um, congested conditions. So, in summary, uh, there are still many and significant issues um, that have to be resolved in order to integrate autonomous vehicles, connected vehicles, um, into the existing um, highway network. Um, it doesn't seem like we would be able to have dedicated lanes just for autonomous vehicles, at least initially. Uh, so, ha finding a way where both can work together, um, conventional vehicles with connected and autonomous, uh, is important. Um, and as I said earlier, 
only autonomy or only connectivity is only going to get us uh, so far. It will not be able to provide us with solutions under many types of, uh, of situations and scenarios. Uh, a better way to, to do this is to have both connectivity and autonomy um, together so that you uh, maximize the amount of information that the vehicle has or that the pedestrian has, the bicyclist has, uh, to be able to make better informed um, decisions. And so with, uh, with the iStreet uh, test bed, um, given what I've uh, uh, discussed so far in terms of how autonomy works, how connectivity works, what we're trying to do is to include um, both and develop in Gainesville a real world uh, test bed where both of these technologies uh, and, and several others um, can be tested in a, in a smart city um, environment. Um, so the, we started with the, uh, the iStreet test bed uh, back in uh, 2016 or so. Uh, the Florida Department of Transportation um, funded us to do a, um, a planning level study to evaluate what other test beds there were out there, what types of technologies they, they were testing, uh, what were the needs within Florida, um, and uh, to come up with a plan for how we would um, deploy, test, uh, develop, evaluate different advanced technologies in a real world environment. Because that's where the challenge really is. Um, based on where, um, if you see um, autonomous vehicles working in a closed course environment, no problems because things are predictable. Um, and so we are now beyond that and we should be looking at how do we, uh, how are we able to incorporate those technologies in a real world environment um, and um, develop them further so that they can um, provide the mobility and safety uh, benefits that uh, that we expect um, and so we started the ice street test but it's been a couple of years um, I will talk some more about um, the type of uh, infrastructure that we are uh, installing around Gainesville um, and uh, and where do we we go from there um, if you are not familiar with Florida it is the third largest most populous uh, state in the in the US uh, so the Florida Department of Transportation is a, really a leader in terms of um, uh, research development because they, they have significant funding. Um, the roads in Florida are relatively better relative to other uh, northern uh, states because it doesn't snow and so the pavement um, is, is better maintained. But also because Florida is a large state, it, it attracts a, a significant amount of tourism they have better funding for, uh, for infrastructure. So they've been better set for, for having those types of, uh, uh, um, of uh, deployments and looking forward into, um, uh, into the um, development of advanced technologies. Florida also has a significant proportion of uh, older drivers uh, and older visitors. There's, uh, it attracts, Florida attracts people who come to Florida to retire especially South Florida. And so uh, a large part of the population um, will be or has been looking into mobility options. And so if autonomy works in any way, it's going to help a significant uh, part of the, of the population. So uh, any questions so far? OK. Um, let me uh, talk next about the um, I Street infrastructure. Okay, so why why choose Gainesville? Um, the first uh, large university. Um, we have the type of research uh, already ongoing that would support uh, the development of those technologies. As I said, through the um, through the UFTI with uh, several different disciplines, which are really required in order to make this work. It's not just one um, 
uh, type of expertise. It's uh, it's several different different ones. Um, we have a vibrant campus with heavy pedestrian bicycle flows. Now we have scooters. We've had um, the motorized scooters. Now we have all kinds of other scooters. Uh, we have uh, one of the most used um, uh, transit systems in Florida because um, they serve both the University of Florida and the Santa Fe College. Uh, and those are free for, for students, so students use them very heavily. Um, we have a relatively younger population um, and they are willing to use advanced technologies. Um, and uh, we have uh, relatively good weather so we don't have to worry about snow and, and all that. We can still test technologies under relatively good, good weather. Um, and uh, we have relatively low speeds around campus. So we don't have to necessarily go with high speeds. We can still be a little bit more conservative in terms of um, implementing new technologies in an environment where, uh, you know, if uh, God forbid there is a conflict, it, it's going to be at, um, at low speeds. So um, as part of, uh, of I Street and for the far past uh, three or four, uh, or uh, two years, I should say, for the past two years, we've been looking into um, funding um, what we call in, in basic infrastructure projects. And, uh, We've worked with our partners, the Florida Department of Transportation, the city of Gainesville, uh, to um, each of us has access to different funding sources. And so we kind of leverage what each of us is able to accomplish in terms of funding. Um, one of the uh, projects that is funded by, the, by FDOT, the Florida Department of Transportation, is, uh, is FRAME, um, and that is to install roadside units along I-75. So this is a map of Gainesville. Here's the campus. Um, the green is, is the campus. I-75 is a, is a freeway uh, that runs along um, the west part of, uh, of the city. Um, and so there, um, we're, we're, FDOT is installing 150 roadside units uh, which are able to provide connectivity to the infrastructure. Um, in order to, to do this, there have been several steps because this type of equipment is not available, oh, I'm going to order 150 units and install them. There are several different steps in order to, to do that, and it started with um, FDOT hiring a consultant, Atkins, um, Atkins looked into several different vendors. They started doing s tests in a closed course environment to make sure that what they were able to, uh, to accomplish was what the intent was. And so there, there were several steps and we're now at the point where um, of selection of what the particular equipment will be and so installation will happen uh, soon. So it, it's, it takes a long time to, to get from an idea into, into implementation. So that was one of the concepts, or one of the projects. Um, the second one is the UF aid, which uh, is this blue area here. And the objective there was to um, install and test and develop technologies that would help uh, provide connectivity to pedestrians and bicyclists. So. Uh, to minimize conflicts um, and to, um, to improve safety. So this project, um, FDOT submitted an application to the US DOT, the federal government. Um, AID stands for Accelerated Innovation um, Deployment. And so uh, as part of that, looking at different uh, possible solutions from different vendors, getting those technologies um, the most promising ones to be installed on campus. And this is, this is, um, this area over here, the, that corner of campus is very, very uh, pedestrian, heavy pedestrian traffic, uh, bicycles and, and, uh, and buses. So it is the perfect environment to be able to test um, what the capabilities of those types of technologies are. Um, so for, as part of the UF aid, um, 
there's instrumentation planned at 13 signalized intersections and seven mid-block crossings. Um, and the idea is that uh, we will install um, and evaluate and work with vendors to improve um, different technologies that provide information to pedestrians um, or to bicyclists and to vehicles about each other's uh, presence. Um, the, the Gainesville Trapezium is a, uh, another installation which is uh, primarily on, uh, for, uh, focused on signal control optimization. And that, the um, installation is around the campus. Um, so it should be really trapezoid, but it is, they call it trapezium, uh, but because of the shape of the, of the area around campus. Um, and so, uh, there's 45 uh, RSUs which are uh, going to be deployed sometime this fall. Uh, I know Siemens was selected as the, as the contractor, so the city is working with them and with FDOT to, uh, to install those RSUs in, on the side of the road, and also as part of that contract, they're installing um, uh, communication equipment within, within certain vehicles that belong to the city and the DOT. Um, the last one is the, it's called the Gainesville Mobility um, Autobus, and that is an autonomous shuttle um, that we want to have deployed in the downtown area, and this is, this is roughly the area, the, the downtown Gainesville is around here, uh, kind of a little bit east of the, of the campus, and so uh, the shuttle would be, um, Auton an autonomous shuttle that would operate uh, in the downtown area. And I'll talk a little bit more uh, about that and, uh, and where we are with it. Um, the idea was also that um, having those basic infrastructure projects that look at specific aspects of, of connectivity, then we can engage with additional uh, industry and leverage these for uh, going into additional uh, research on how we can use this information to improve mobility and, and safety. Oops. Okay, so uh, let me talk a little bit about the, um, uh, the autonomous vehicle um, shuttle. Um, the uh, Florida DOT funded a pilot project and gave money to the city of Gainesville to deploy and operate on a pilot basis um, this autonomous vehicle. Um, and the, the plan has been to integrate this with existing transit service. So the transit agency, RTS, um, in Gainesville, um, received the money, um, went through procurement, um, Transdev was the company selected, um, and uh, the vehicles um, came, they did a test, I'm going to show you some uh, um, videos of it, um, and the vehicles selected have 12, they, they can accommodate 12 uh, passengers, um, and uh, where we are right now is we are waiting for NHTSA approval to do those tests. NHTSA is the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration from the federal government. Um, so the bureaucracy has been very, very extensive in this. So the vehicles uh, are engaged with, the contract is in place, we're all ready to have uh, this pilot. Uh, and so there were several months where we didn't hear anything back from, from NHTSA and the mayor went to DC. Uh, and so on. So finally, we just heard last week, and they allow us to have uh, the test of phase one, but with no passengers. Um, what's not clear to me is what uh, performance metrics they want to see after that in order to eventually allow uh, passengers. But what we've done so far from the UF perspective is we've done a before uh, study um, which was a survey of the population to understand what the um, uh, perceptions of autonomy are, how people were going to use, uh, are, um, how comfortable they were in using uh, an autonomous shuttle. 
And what we found is that relative to uh, surveys across the US, the acceptance of autonomy was relatively higher. And I think it is because uh, what I was saying earlier, we have a younger population, they're more comfortable with, uh, with advanced technologies, they're more willing to try um, new things. And so we had about a, a 50 to 60% of the people were very comfortable um, taking the, uh, the autonomous shuttle. Um, this is where the, this is the downtown area. Um, and so the, the way the pilot uh, was conceived was to have uh, different phases. Phase one is the, is the blue area over there. Uh, so it's a much shorter um, link and it, uh, it's just a, it is within the existing network, um, but it doesn't go through roundabouts, traffic lights. Um, it's a, it's a kind of a simpler route to get started with. In phase two, uh, the route would continue and go and cross this um, major uh, roadway, which is 13th uh, Street, and go, go into campus and then um, come back. And that requires crossing a traffic signal. So it, it has additional uh, complications. Uh, phase three is to go, is the green part. So it would uh, go all the way down to. Um, this is a new, this is a park, it's called Depot Park. Uh, do you know Gatorade? You know what Gatorade is? It was invented at UF. So UF receives a significant uh, uh, income from, from Gatorade. So drink Gatorade. <laughs> um, but also the, um, the daughter of the inventor uh, has built a little museum there, the Cade Museum. The, the inventor's name is Cade. Uh, and so the Cade Museum is, uh, is over there at, the, at Depot Park. So this is phase three, um, which would add a little bit more uh, complexity. And then what, what TransDev wants to do is to have on-demand uh, transportation within this, this corridor. Uh, but that's further uh, uh, down the road. We see what, the, what happens with that. Um, so in, in order to prepare, uh, Transdev uh, came and they had to they have to map the the route and this is the um, the little vehicle um, going through the the route and because it's mapping it's going really really slow look what happens so there's a bicyclist that that came through as the vehicle was getting ready to pull over um, and the vehicle with its sensors was able to, to stop. This was not staged, it just happened. The bicyclist just zoomed by as the vehicle was, uh, was pulling over. Um, but, you know, it is, it's a good demonstration of the way um, autonomy is, is supposed to work. Um, so the vehicle was going really, really slow for mapping and uh, that didn't work to its advantage because people were complaining. Why does this toaster running down the road at three miles an hour? So people were just not very happy. <laughs> uh, hopefully we'll overcome that. But the, uh, the, spe the maximum speed that the vehicle um, will be going is I think uh, 20 or 25 miles an hour. So it's gonna be slow. It's gonna be slow through the downtown. Uh, and because it's a pilot, you know, it's better that it's, it is slow. Um, and let me show you, um, before it started to map this, we had done some um, testing of the, of the vehicle um, in a closed facility. It's an RTS, old, old RTS facility. And there were several uh, people, the press, they came to see what the, how the vehicle works. If you want to start it, you press this green button when you're, uh, uh, when you're inside it. Um, it has a, um, a safety driver um, in, in the vehicle uh, the, 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 with the joysticks. That's the safety driver. They don't have to be there, but the, uh, it seems people are, uh, feel better. Um, the person walking in front of it is the um, uh, assistant city manager. <laughs> so he, uh, 
he felt comfortable enough to walk in front of it, and so we had him walk in front of it several times to videotape it, <laughs> and, uh, and he was okay with it. Um, but the, there is a safety driver inside um, just because people may not feel comfortable being um, on their own in a vehicle, uh, even though it's, it's not going to operate late at night and so on, but it's better to have somebody who's kind of in charge um, just to explain to people how this works um, and, and you know, have some safety uh, role. Uh, but if you think about it, if you've been watching old movies, in the old movies, there was a person in the elevator who was operating the elevator. It's kind of a similar role. And so eventually, you know, we don't need anybody in the elevators anymore. We can press the button by on our own. And so I think it's the same uh, with autonomy. It's just a, um, a level of, um, uh, of comfort for, uh, for that. Um, Let me show you the, um, this is the Gainesville uh, trapezium uh, in a little more uh, detailed uh, map. Again, this is, the, this is the University of Florida. Uh, this is the major highway Archer. Um, this is 34th. This is 13th. Uh, north is, is um, University uh, Avenue. And we have in the middle of campus a big lake with alligators, uh, so you, you should not go too close to that with, uh, with your lunch. Um, but so the tra what the trapezium, uh, the objective is to look into signal control optimization and provide um, vehicles with information about um, signal control and exchange information about um, the location of the vehicles. Um, what uh, we're hoping to achieve there is you know, with, um, uh, with signal control systems, you can optimize them if you have uh, detailed information on when vehicles arrive, what their speed is, and so on. So you can, um, instead of having um, uh, loop detectors in, in the pavement, you know what loop detectors are, when you uh, detect the presence of a vehicle, and you can actuate and extend the green from, for different approaches. And so, um, connectivity and having that information about the vehicle location and, and, and speed and so on can help you in optimizing the signal control through the corridor. So we will be doing, um, we will be experimenting with how to use connectivity um, uh, for, uh, for signal control. The information that we will have also, uh, I think, can be leveraged for, for other types of applications once you have um, connectivity information at all these um, locations. Uh, this is a more detailed map of the uh, of the aid uh, project. This is um, uh, the the northeast part of uh, of campus with uh, heavy pedestrian traffic, and so um, the um, installation will be at um, as I said mid block locations as well as at um, the uh, at, at signalized intersections, and so we will be testing different technologies um, and how able they are to provide information to um, a uh, to the pedestrians and to the bicyclists, and how different technologies are able to accomplish that. Uh, we'll be testing um, uh, what are called passive technologies and more active technologies. So passive are. Uh, those where a pedestrian doesn't have to do anything specific. It's just uh, they're being observed, and based on being observed, um, they, um, th the system will provide the necessary information. And then there are some active ones where the pedestrian has to do something specific in order to trigger the, um, the system. Um, for this one, we're also going to install uh, what are ca uh, called fish eye cameras uh, that are um, they are I'll show you some videos a little later, but they are able to see the entire intersection. Um, and, and based on that, we will be doing some um, validation and additional uh, um, evaluations and comparisons uh, about uh, pedestrian bicycle uh, behavior. Okay. All right, then uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about specific uh, research projects, um, any, any questions on infrastructure, anything so far?
Okay. Yeah, you're good. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, so one of the projects we're working on, uh, this is led by one of our computer science uh, faculty affiliates, is to develop a data analytics um, uh, web interface. Uh, what this involves and what we've been trying to do with iStreet is for, for every single one of the projects, we want the data that are being generated to feed into a, a database. Um, and one of the uh, tricks there is to keep the information that we need without um, expending heavily on resources to keep you know, real-time information uh, that will just clog the system. And so um, the, the objective is to be able to relate in terms of space and time information that is being generated um, already by traffic signals, uh, the traffic signal status, and integrate into that uh, what connected vehicle trajectories uh, look like, um, uh, what autonomous vehicle trajectories look like, uh, how pedestrians uh, work. And I'll, for, for several of the projects I will describe, the idea is that we want the information that's generated to feed into that one database. Um, and the objective is, again, because you can um, leverage different uh, databases into the same platform and relate them in, in different ways that you maybe we hadn't thought about even when we are starting out. Um, and it's, it's going to be used for, uh, for research uh, initially, but uh, we also want it to be usable by the city when making traffic management type decisions. Um, Sanjay Ranka is the uh, professor in computer science who's, who's taking the lead on that. And he also got a small grant from, from Amazon to, to have the uh, platform uh, in place for, uh, for generating those. Um, and FDOT has been funding um, a lot of the, uh, of the research. Uh, we recently got a grant also from the National Science Foundation uh, to, uh, to advance this. Um, so uh, the idea is that the, the data also will be available in a web interface for others who want to use it um, across, uh, across Florida. One of the first um, applications that uh, Dr. Ranka has worked on is on uh, um, hotspot identification based on um, uh, different uh, functionalities of the signals, um, he's able to get into uh, the signal controllers and get real-time information. And I have to tell you, one of the challenges in getting there was in working with the specific signal control manufacturer. There's a signal control manufacturer uh, that has installed most of the controllers in, in Gainesville, and they were initially not willing to provide direct access to the controller. Um, and uh, because those have been installed many years ago, the city didn't think to put in the contract that installing the controllers means we have access to the raw data. And so um, if, you, if you're working with uh, such a contract, uh, you know, I would advise to have that specifically spelled out uh, because um, down the road, you don't know how you want to you wanna use the data. And because um, data are becoming such a huge commodity, it is becoming an issue now for cities um, in terms of who owns the data that are, that are being generated. There are companies that uh, receive the data for free and then they manipulate and they distribute. But um, you know, if the city has invested in, uh, in the equipment, and they are providing the data, uh, who owns the data, and you know, should they be charging or should, should they not be charging, and who has access to what. Uh, so in a smart city environment, this becomes very, very important. Uh, so um, if you're thinking about going in that direction, I would say make sure that you, have, you own the data or the city owns the data. Um, so anyway, after many, many months, we were able to get access to, to the signal control. And so this is uh, part of the, um, of the work that, that looked into um, 
hotspot identification by, uh, by time of day and uh, time, uh, day of week and so on. Um, another project which is uh, really the, the city of Gainesville uh, has been working on is uh, through a company called the Connected Signals. Oh, it should be doing that. Uh, through a company called Connected Signals, um, they're able to get um, information on um, the status of different signals. And so, um, sorry, let me get that back up. Let me do this. Can you still see? Okay. Um, so what the, what this company Connected Signals uh, provides is it can tap into the city of Gainesville um, uh, traffic management center and then it uh, generates the status of the, of the signal and it, it can provide um, a predicted um, time to green. They feed that into an app. So you as the driver, you can download the app, you can have it in your vehicle, and you can see as you're driving down the road, uh, when will the signal turn uh, green, when it will turn red. And I noticed here in San Carlos, you have some of the, your traffic lights have a timer, which is, uh, I haven't seen that. I, I need to take a picture of it <laughs> eventually. But uh, so it's a, that's the same um, functionality, but this, brings it inside your vehicle, and it's uh, what, what the company is doing, it's, they're predicting it, it's not the actual. So they are anticipating, based on historical information, how long it, uh, it will take. Um, and uh, one of our students is doing a, um, his PhD on um, how people uh, use this information uh, if, if they get distracted by having this on their phone as one more thing. Uh, one more piece of information, um, and um, also how um, how accurate it is, it is what this company provides relative to what uh, uh, actually happens. Um, my um, my personal use of the system, and I, it's not based on statistical information or anything, is that the system doesn't work well when it's congested, when the, the system is congested. It does not predict very well when the, uh, uh, the green is going to, to change. Um, I've, I've used it, some of those uh, routes are on my commute.
Okay. Is this alright? Is it work? Okay. Another uh, another ongoing project um, is to um, evaluate a system that uh, provides through an app information to the driver uh, when they're going through a school zone um, and also when they are approaching a bicyclist and they're too close. So what the system does is um, for the school zones, um, it uh, provides uh, geofenced information for the location of a school zone. And so when the vehicle um, gets through uh, the, 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 the school zone, it provides a warning if you're, if you're going too fast. Um, same with um, when you are approaching a, a bicyclist, uh, you get an alarm that you're, you're too close um, to the to the bicyclist. Um, what, uh, let me show you what the warnings um, look like. Um, so if you are, uh, if you are speeding, you're gonna get this alert, and I believe it's also audible. Um, if you are, uh, uh, if, if everything is okay, you're just gonna get um, uh, information you are in the school zone. Um, and you might get, if you are close to um, your speed limit, you're going to get a, a, a different uh, warning. Um, so part of the, um, of the study, of course, to, you know, in order for us to, to do this study, we had to go through IRB approval. And so initially, um, we, um, so we wanted to use our own uh, bicyclists to to try this and so use our own uh, students, but uh, they were saying no, you cannot do this kind of, of testing, which is kind of interesting because um, people use this. This is part of the highway system already, and I even without our testing, people bicycle down those lanes. But then, if we had to put our own people into the bike lane, they were like, no, you can't use your own. Um, people uh, and then have subjects drive the vehicle. So it was deemed too, uh, too dangerous to use the existing network. Uh, so I, uh, we had to change our, our study a little bit, um, but um, the, um, uh, the study is now ongoing. And this is the, um, the study area. Um, there are uh, both those systems were being uh, tested at the same time. So the, uh, we recruited subjects to drive our own vehicle. Um, the subjects uh, were monitored with respect to what they were doing when they were getting the, the alerts, uh, when they were ge getting close to a bicyclist, when they were within a, a school zone and how they reacted to the system. <coughs> Excuse me. They also had a, um, uh, an eye tracker to see wh where it was they the driver was looking at the time when they were approaching the bicyclist and then how they reacted, whether they were able to see uh, what we wanted them to see and what they, um, what they were monitoring. This, this study is, is, um, is still on, ongoing. This is one of our... Uh, uh, one of the fisheye cameras that is already installed and we, uh, we expect we will install um, several more. Um, what, uh, um, what we're hoping to get from that is, uh, first of all, near misses, um, where um, you can um, identify the presence of different objects through the fisheye camera. Um, and then um, at a particular intersection, you can um, observe whenever two objects come too close um, together. And so, um, you know, we could use specific thresholds and say, if, those, if two objects come together at a particular time uh, and space, that constitutes a near miss. And so the idea is to use these as an indicator of, uh, uh, of safety at the intersection. So 
uh, trying to correlate uh, or anticipate where crashes might happen um, at, a, at a particular location, identify dangerous um, locations, and even identify whenever you have um, uh, near misses between vehicles or between vehicles and, and pedestrians. Um, so it's looking at... Oh, it went back. Hold on. if I can get this. Um, so it's, it's, it's looking at near misses, but uh, it's also looking at tracking um, of, of different objects um, through, the, through the intersection. Um, uh, we were also looking at how pedestrians um, cross and how you're able to, uh, to identify pedestrian tracking and use that information um, for, for safety as well as, um, as mobility. One of our other applications deals with um, heavy vehicle detection. Um, the uh, DOT was interested in, in um, identifying different types of, uh, of trucks uh, running through I-75 and be able to um, look at the side of the, of the vehicle and identify what kind of, uh, of commodity it was for, uh, for classification purposes. So we have several of our, um, uh, of our projects doing um, vehicle and generally object identification through, through video analytics. Um, and again, this is where uh, machine learning comes into, place where, uh, into play, where you're, you're looking at um, image recognition uh, for, for different types of, um, uh, of applications. Um, we've been doing some more with, um, with vehicle detection where we are analyzing uh, weaving areas um, on the freeway and we want to use this to extract the data so that we don't have to do it manually. So within a weave you're looking at origin destinations and so we're trying to track um, through video from a drone how vehicles um, go through um, uh, and uh, how, how vehicles go through a weave um, and a be able to extract the trajectory um, automatically. Um, one of the issues with that, with the video analytics, is that the closer the vehicle is to the camera, the more information you have. But if you, once the vehicle um, is further away, you don't have as much um, um, detail in terms of its, uh, of its image. And so we've been able to get it up to um, 90% accuracy, but uh, for us to do um, uh, more of a implementation for, uh, for weaving analysis, it needs to be a little bit higher, maybe around 95. So still working uh, on that. But the, uh, with the video, uh, the cameras, um, fish eye cameras, the cameras that are um, uh, from the mobilized system on the transit buses, one of the other things we are we're trying to do is to see if we can use multiple sources of information at specific locations to, to look at conflicts from many different perspectives at a particular uh, location. One of the other projects, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit uh, in much more detail later this, uh, this afternoon. Oh, okay. Um, I have about uh, maybe 10 more slides. Or just finish and then we can have one slide. Yeah, okay. Um, so the um, autonomous um, and connected vehicle applications for signal control uh, we, what we're doing is um, within an intersection we have a communication area as vehicles are approaching so we can get um, 
the location and the speed of vehicles as they approach the intersection. We use that to optimize uh, signal control. Um, and um, we provide optimal vehicle trajectories to the vehicle and optimal signalization to the controller. Um, so this is something that we're, we're working on. Uh, we have it simulated. We're working on, uh, on field implementation. Um, sensor fusion is another application, area of application uh, we're using where we, um, we use information from dedicated short-range communication, uh, video, um, and uh, radar, and synthesize this in order to create um, a, a, a more accurate picture of where uh, vehicles um, are and what their trajectory is. Uh, some of the sensors that, the, that we've been using, um, radar, this is the radar, um, DSRC uh, and camera. So we install these at a particular intersection. We use this information in our uh, signal control um, optimization. I, I already talked about the, uh, the suitcase and how we use that for, uh, for communication. Um, this is the fusion of DSRC and radar, um, where we use information, again, from both. Uh, one is accurate closer, the other is accurate further, and so you can create different weights for the information that you receive from each one along the length of the corridor, and by weighing that, um, you can provide uh, a more accurate trajectory um, and location of the vehicle and that's what's needed for our signal control optimization algorithm. Um, one of our uh, uh, very uh, preliminary apps uh, that we're, we're creating for connected vehicles to receive the information real time based on the actual um, signalization on how long will it take for the vehicle to turn green so that you can adjust your speed um, and you don't have to uh, um, suddenly decelerate and then uh, have to stop. Um, this is the view from inside our, uh, our autonomous vehicle as it was, uh, was mapping. Um, the this is a closed course facility in Tallahassee in, uh, in Florida. Uh, we've been doing some testing there. Um, it's our vehicle is not as sleek as some of the, uh, the, the more commercially available ones, but uh, um, it, can, uh, it can do the job and it can receive trajectories and execute them, so it's, uh, it's good enough for our testing. Um, and uh, the image there at the on the right, is, uh, it shows the, the mapping of the, of the area. And as you can see, there's a lot of, inter of uh, uh, interpretation of those uh, clouds of, uh, of data points that uh, that needs to happen for the vehicle to be able to um, to operate um, within uh, within the network. And one of our other um, evaluations, uh, we're we're doing evaluations for specific types of. Uh, Technologies in this case the smart micro radar. It's uh, it's called a 3D radar. Um, so we have installed it at an intersection. We're doing an evaluation of how well it's able to give us information um, relative to uh, to other types of uh, of equipment. This is a company uh, based in uh, Germany, and so they sent us the radar. We had it. We worked with the city to install it and to evaluate how well. Um, it provides information. Uh, we're uh, finishing the study. We should have it complete uh, next month. And uh, that just gives you an overview of the different types of uh, technologies and projects that are ongoing within I Street. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. 
I cannot answer that. I uh, yes, I don't know what the the computing power is for the for the autonomous vehicle. Uh, we um, we have a dedicated computer for the signal control optimization, which is able to handle both the fusion and the optimization. Uh, but it's a different part of the team that deals with the with the hardware and the software. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Not that. Yeah, <laughs> I can put you in touch with the right people in the, on the team, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that the, the uh, industry generally has a has been uh, too optimistic about the development of the technologies and, and their deployment even in the US um, where there are tests already. I think that there are many scenarios that people hadn't anticipated um, and uh, I see a lot of issues with industry working closely with government and there are, uh, they have very different objectives and they are um, I don't think that they yet understand well each other's culture to be able to work together to get the system where it needs to be. Um, I am not sure how um, uh, you know how Latin America would would perceive it and what the what the needs are, the specific needs and and things where you know it would be a natural um, transition. But I I think that there's a lot of work that still needs to happen. Um, from the perspective of um, understanding um, how to put it all together, it's 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 not uh, it's not clear yet. Uh, there's a lot of learning that needs to happen, um, even from uh, you know the personnel that is managing the traffic systems in the U.S. There's a lot of training that needs to happen for it to to get to the next level. Uh, so you know, I, I would say. Uh, within the U.S., where I'm more familiar, it's uh, you know it's going to be a very gradual and slow uh, implementation. It's possible that there's more uh, that can be done on freeways uh, because there's fewer events um, and unexpected conditions. You know, you don't have the pedestrians, the bicyclists, and so on. So, so I can see more of implementation um, on freeways. We were talking about uh, truck platooning. Uh, and you know this is something that is already happening in um, in some situations, and so I can see those types of implementations uh, sooner. And I think we were talking about Brazil specifically that there may be you know the truck platooning may be a more uh, uh, much needed application right now where it can and it can take advantage of the existing network. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, the, the, the signal control, it's a, it's a large team, it's civil engineering, mechanical engineering, computer science, um, and I'll talk more today um, in the afternoon about the different uh, groups, but there's about uh, uh, 10 students and each of them is working on different aspects. There's the software, there's the optimization, there's the fusion, um, several different aspects um, of the work. Uh, so about the three or four faculty, uh, maybe six to eight student, graduate students and uh, a couple of undergrads. Oh, for, the, uh, for, the for the signal control optimization. Um, the contract, uh, so this, this project was funded by the National Science Foundation 
and the first con the, the contract from them was uh, 1.3 million over five years and we're now in the fifth year which is called the transition to practice so that we're getting ready to implement um, in addition to that we uh, completed a project with f dot they were more interested in the hardware and software and that was about 450,000 um, and uh, we are just starting the last um, uh, the third project with F dot specifically to look into uh, pedestrian um, considerations and how you sense pedestrians and how you feed that information into the optimization because the intersection we're installing it at is um, has pedestrian traffic and we are not able to install unless we figure out that and so that contract is 430,000 and it just started just to uh, to get us uh, through um, the implementation so overall probably two million and this is for um, the one one intersection you know so the to, to get everything going for the one intersection because uh, th there's there is the um, optimization aspect and how to develop optimization algorithms but when you start trying to implement there are very different considerations and so that adds to the uh, to the problems and the issues that need to be resolved yeah but I'll, I'll talk some more this afternoon yeah on that yeah